All right, so, uh, so welcome to the hand and wrist section. Uh, I'm Mike Baskies. Uh, just some general housekeeping. I just wanted to thank uh, Jim, Anthony, and Anthony for the opportunity to speak this morning, and then uh, Chris and Melissa in the ortho department for helping to do the logistics. Uh, first, uh, we're going to fly through basic anatomy of the wrist and hand. This is something that's covered in volumes of textbooks, but we're going to do it in 10 minutes. So. Uh, so when we talk about anatomy, uh, we're talking about bones, joints, tendons, ligaments, nerves, and vessels. You probably remember this from your first year anatomy course in medical school. Uh, when we look down at our hands, the bones that are directly under our fingernails and working our way to our hands are our phalanges, distal, middle, and proximal, working from the end closer to your hand. Uh, when you look at your hand proper, you're looking at the metacarpals, which connect your digits to your wrist. And then these little pebbles of bones, your carpal bones, uh, these bones are really important for wrist motion and stability, um, and we'll talk more about those as we go along here. Uh, where the wrist meets the forearm, we're talking about the radius and the ulna. The radius is on the side of your thumb, ulna is on the side of your pinky. So again, bones of the hand, distal phalanges, middle phalanges, proximal phalanges. Uh, metacarpals, thumb, index long, ring, and small. Uh, and then bones of the wrist. We divide these into distal and proximal carpal rows. So distal carpal row, trapezium directly under the thumb metacarpal, trapezoid directly underneath the index finger metacarpal, uh, capitate directly underneath the long finger metacarpal, and the hamate directly underneath the ring finger and small finger metacarpals. The scaphoid is this yellow bone. Uh, scaphoid, lunate, and triquetrum form your proximal carpal row, and your pisiborm is a, is a small pebble on the volar or palmar aspect of your triquetrum. As you come down, um, the radius meets the scaphoid and lunate and forms the radiocarpal joint. Your ulna uh, is directed at the ulnocarpal articulation. And so when we talk about the joints of the hand, we typically talk about the distal interphalangeal joints, your DIP joints. That's where these last two bones meet, your middle and distal phalanges. We talk about the proximal interphalangeal joints, where your proximal and middle phalanges meet. Your metacarpal phalangeal joints, where your metacarpals meet the respective proximal phalanges. Carpal metacarpal articulations, or CMC joints, where the metacarpals meet the carpal bones. And the one that uh, gets the most attention, and one we'll talk about at length in just a minute, is your trapezium metacarpal joint, or your uh, thumb carpal metacarpal articulation. Uh, joints of the wrist. Um, so when we look at where the metacarpals meet these, uh, this distal carpal row, uh, those are your carpal metacarpal articulations. We refer to the metacarpal joint as the articulations between the proximal and distal carpal row. Uh, the radiocarpal articulation, again, is where the radius meets the scaphoid and the lunate. Ulnocarpal articulation is where the ulna meets the lunate and the triquetrum. Your distal radial ulnar joint is where the radius and ulnar articulate with each other. Uh, really important, um, forearm flexor anatomy. So if you take the palm of your hand and you look down at your forearm, we're looking at all of the muscles that emanate basically from the level of your elbow to the level of your wrist and digits. And these are really important when we talk about motion of the wrist, motion of the digits, and more importantly, when we talk about compartment syndrome. So trauma-related, uh, really specific emergencies in the forearm, we get concerned about these tendons and muscle bellies specifically. Superficially, we're talking about the pronator teres, the flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, and flexor carpi ulnaris. Uh, deep, we talk about the flexor digitorum profundus, uh, the flexor pollicis longus, and pronator quadratus. Uh, and in between these two, in the intermediate layer, is your flexor digitorum superficialis. Um, those muscles, the muscles on that flex, all emanate from the medial aspect of your elbow, your medial epicondyle. When we talk about the, you look down, if you take your hand and you look down at the nail side of your, of your hand and you're looking at the forearm on the top, you're talking about your extensor tendons. And these almost all emanate from the lateral epicondyle, lateral aspect of your elbow. They include the ECRL, ECRB, uh, your extensor carpi ulnaris, the common extensor tendons, uh, your extensor digiti minimi, which specifically moves your small finger, and your extensor indices proprius, which specifically moves the index finger, as well as the extensors of the thumb. As we move our way down from the forearm to the wrist, you can't talk about volar anatomy or palmar anatomy of the wrist without talking about the carpal tunnel. 
constituents of the carpal tunnel, so directly deep to the transverse carpal ligament at the level of your wrist, um, lies the median nerve, the most radial structure, so something that constantly comes up in board examinations and the like. Uh, what's the most radial structure in the carpal tunnel? It's your flexor pollicis longus, your flexor for your thumb. And then um, deep to the median nerve, you have the layer of flexor digitorum superficialis tendons. These are the tendons that only flex the PIP joint. And then you have the FDP tendons just deep to that that flex both the PIP and DIP joints of the digits. In the wrist, if you take a look at the top of your wrist, so you're looking at the nail side of your fingers and you're looking at the wrist on the top of the wrist, these are divided, these wrist extensors are divided into compartments and each of these compartments comes with its own set of tendons and likely its own set of problems. Compartment number one, your APL, abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. Um, these tendons are the ones that are responsible for de Quervain's tenosynovitis or tendonitis on the radial aspect of the wrist. ECRL and ECRB, these are the tendons just next to those on the going, uh, going ulnar to radial. Um, so ECRL, ECRB, these tendons are res res uh, responsible for something called um, intersection syndrome, another very common form of tendonitis in the wrist. Extensor pollicis longus, this is a tendon that extends the thumb, and that tendon is very commonly injured with distal radius fractures, either acutely or chronically. Um, your EDC tendons, so if you look down at your hand, those tendons that extend your digits, those are your common extensor tendons. Those tendons are commonly um, inflamed in uh, inflammatory arthropathies or can be lacerated in trauma. Um, extensor digit emimini, that's compartment number five, so your EDM is commonly involved in atraumatic ruptures and rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and lastly, compartment number six, your e ECU or your ECU tendon, that tendon's commonly involved in snapping ECU or instability of the ECU. We see that in racket sports uh, and baseball players. So um, this is a slide that's garnered the attention of entire textbooks, but we're gonna talk about it in five seconds. Basically, your flexor tendon anatomy. Most important thing to know, your FDP tendon. Those are the tendons that start on the medial epicondyle and run all the way to the distal phalanx. So they're gonna bend your PIP joint and your DIP joint. Your FDS tendon, those are the tendons that start on the medial epicondyle. They're only gonna run to the middle phalanx, so they're only gonna bend your PIP joint. They're only gonna bend one of those joints. Your pulleys, so another extremely complex topic. The most important thing to know about the pulleys is that these are the structures that are gonna keep your flexor tendons very close to the underlying bone. Which pulley do you really need to know about? It's the A1 pulley. So if you look down at the palm of your hand, the guy that's sitting right at the base of the digit where your digits meet your palm, that's your A1 pulley and cross section. So this guy, why is he so important? He's so important because he's the guy that gets inflamed in trigger finger. Trigger finger is one of the most common conditions uh, known to man and certainly within the hand and wrist. And so A1 pulley is really important to know about. A2 I just included because we see this in racket sport players, mountain climbers, and these can get injured and need to be repaired on occasion. Flexor tendon zones of injury. So again, very complex slide. The most important thing to know, so zone two, this is no man's land, but zone two flexor tendon injuries, those usually involve injuries of both the FDS and the FDP, and so those are really important to know about because we need to know if we need to attend to a flexor tendon injury, those usually need to be attended to in the, in the first of several days, not weeks or months after an injury. And so it's these lacerations uh, in the digits uh, from the level of the middle phalanx to the level of the distal palm. Those are really important lacerations to know about. Uh, zone one injuries typically just involve the FDP tendon unless they extend proximally. Um, these tendons can retract. They can retract all the way to the level of the wrist and distal forearm because flexor tendons are sort of like rubber bands like that. Extensor tendon injuries. So your extensor tendons, if you look down at the nail uh, aspect of your fingers and the top of your hands, um, these tendons are connected by juncturi tendinum, which, which help to keep the tendons stabilized. Um, but here's just a depiction of those tendons as they pass through the compartments. And it's your common extensor tendons, your EDM, your EIP, and your EPL that are going to extend distally to the digits. 
Extensor tendon zo zones of laceration, we don't talk about, when I get a call from the emergency room or from a primary care physician, they don't tell me I have a zone one extensor tendon laceration, but, but for um, lack of better description, these zone one injuries are really important. These are your mallet fingers. So when a patient has a ball that runs into their digit or when they jam their finger, um, typically it's their distal extensor tendon that gets injured, and that's where this extensor tendon inserts on the distal phalanx. Uh, most zone two, three, four, five lacerations or injuries are from open injuries or laceration injuries, but they can be from closed trauma as well. Nerves of the hand and wrist. So we're gonna talk about this extremely complex topic very briefly. Median nerve, that's gonna govern sensation. You look down at your palm, your thumb index long and half of your ring finger. That's controlled by your median nerve. We talk about carpal tunnel syndrome. That's because the median nerve is compressed at the wrist and it typically leads to presentation of numbness or decreased sensation in the median nerve sensory distribution. Ulnar nerve, so the ulnar nerve governs the ulnar aspect of the ring finger and all of your small finger, if that's numb, we're thinking about cubital tunnel syndrome or compression of the ulnar nerve down at the wrist. Um, radial nerve governs sensation to the dorsal and radial aspect of the hand. So your median nerve, another very complex slide, there'll be a test on this after this talk. Um, so uh, your median nerve gives, uh, your C5 to T1 nerve, cervical nerve roots gives rise to your median nerve medial and lateral cords of your brachial plexus. The median nerve runs on the anterior aspect of your forearm. In the proximal forearm, it's running uh, between your pronator teres and your biceps tendon. It's gonna travel between those FDS and FDP muscle bellies and emerge within the carpal tunnel between the FDS and the FPL tendons just underneath the transverse carpal ligament. Your branches of your median nerve, really important. Your AIN nerve, your anterior interosseous nerve, this is the thing that gives rise to uh, motor innervation to your FDP index and long fingers, your flexor pollicis longus, you have your palmar cutaneous nerve of the, me median, of the median nerve, which is gonna give you sensation to your um, thenar eminence, your recurrent motor branch, which is gonna govern the muscles. So if you look down at your thumb, these muscles all get feed from this median nerve and its recurrent motor branch, and your distal palmar cutaneous branches, that's what's gonna give rise to the digital sensation distally. Your ulnar nerve, so this is gonna get feed from C8 and T1 cervical nerve roots, medial cord of the brachial plexus. It runs behind the medial epicondyle, just like Dr. Black talked about earlier. It's gonna dive between the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris and travel between the FCU and FDP within the forearm. At the wrist, it's passing superficial to the transverse carpal ligament, and with the hand, it enters via Guillain's canal, which is just ulnar to the carpal tunnel. Your ulnar nerve innervation, so motor. This is gonna do most of your grip, your ulnar nerve, because it's controlling your FCU and your FDP to the ring and small fingers, and your ring and small are what you use mostly for grip. Thenar, so adductor pollicis in the deep part of your flexor pollicis brevis, another very popular boards question. What's the one or two muscles that get fed by the ulnar nerve within the thumb? These are those two guys. Digits, so your inner osseae, the things that adduct your fingers, so spread them out wide and bring your fingers back into your palm or direct, directly central. Those are your inner osseous, uh, inner ossei muscles. Um, hypothenars, so the muscles on, not on the thumb side, but on the pinky side of your palm, those muscles are all fed by the ulnar nerve. And then of course your sensory branches, dorsal cutaneous branch, palmar cutaneous branch, and superficial terminal branches. Your radial nerve, that's given fed by your C5 to T1 nerve roots posterior cord of the brachial plexus. It passes behind the axillary artery, and the thing that's important for uh, elbow and wrist is that it's gonna travel between the triceps, lateral and medial heads, passes through the lateral intermuscular septum and travels between the brachialis and brachial radialis within the proximal forearm, radial nerve branches, if we're talking about wrist extension or digital extension, we're talking about radial nerve. Radial nerve feeds all of those extensors, and so very important to keep that separated from the other two. Vessels of the hand and wrist, these almost entirely revolve around feed from the radial and ulnar arteries. Your radial artery runs between your brachial radialis and flexor carpi radialis. It gives rise to the deep palmar arch in, in significance, and so you have a superficial and deep palmar arch. Your ulnar artery runs under your FCU and with your ulnar nerve through Guillain's canal. 
Ligaments of the wrist, this is a, a summation statement of how ludicrous it is, how many ligaments you have in your wrist. This is why we have so much motion and in the wrist and why it's important from a stabilizing structure. Um, these ligaments all give rise to, in some aspect, one way or another, to stability of the motion of the wrist. And so it's very important to understand that interruption of any one of these can give rise to instability between one, two, or several of the bones within the wrist. You always have to remember where you came from. So uh, in Boston, we wear winter coats to baseball games in April and May. And so uh, that's the brief summation of anatomy of the hand and the wrist. Before we go on, any questions about anatomy? no control. <laughs> it's a little scary. Crazy. Okay, so next, we're going to talk about arthritis of the hand and the wrist. Again, another